All right, welcome to our first ever IUS flag football preseason uh, webinar um, for you guys as district reps. You're welcome to share this with coaches as well. Um, so go ahead to take these slides and share them once you get them. Um, on this webinar will be myself, uh, Zach Sintron, and then Meredith Tarkenton, who was our sports chair. Uh, she was with us for track and field for the first time. So if you were doing track and field, you should know who Meredith is. Just a reminder, uh, plunge registration is open already. Uh, plunge will be February 1st in 2024. So go ahead, if you want to let folks know, they can sign up for their plunge teams now. More likely, you kind of push that stuff when the school year starts, once people get settled. Um, but just a reminder that plunge registration is available. Um, additionally, for those of you that are interested in the State Maryland Recognition Banner Program, uh, that's part of our uh, whole school engagement, youth inclusive leadership, and then IUS sports that you guys already do. Um, that is Unified Champion Schools as a whole. If you do all of those things, you're eligible for the Maryland Banner Recognition Program. If you have more questions, go ahead and click on the link when we send you the slides or use this QR code and it will send you to a site where it gives you more information. Again, uh, she's not the track and field sports chair. Uh, I forgot to edit that. Um, well, she is, but not for this season. Uh, but if you need to get a hold of Meredith, this is her email. Again, if you worked with her, her during track and field, um, you have her email. If not, feel free to take it down now. Additionally, uh, if you don't have my contact information, I would be surprised. Uh, but please, please do take this down. Uh, feel free to reach out over the summer. We'll continue to communicate about flag football stuff over the summer. Um, but as the school year comes back around August, we will pick back up again. So the agenda for tonight, we're going to hit some admin stuff, talk about forms, paperwork, deadlines, that kind of stuff, um, flag football uh, specific stuff, especially since this is the first season. But a lot of the details of flag football stuff we will get to in August, especially with coaches trainings. We want to do in-person coaches training so we can teach our coaches the game how it operates, how they should be coaching it, so on and so forth. So to take the admin stuff right off the top, um, this is the season timeline. August 9th is when spring, or not spring sports, uh, fall sports for MPSSA open. Um, so technically you guys can begin practice then. I know most unified sports programs really don't come back till school starts up to start uh, training and participating. But again, it's an option. Uh, September 1st is the first eligible play date. So I don't know if schools are coming back before the holiday or after the holiday. Uh, you'll have to check with your districts to find out when, but we'd like to have our coaches meetings before that sometime in August. Um, the first round of paperwork that's due, the applications for participations, the CDW and the team roster, essentially the student athlete forms are all due September 15th, um, especially that team roster declaration that also lets your LSS managers have enough time to get them into GMS before the next deadline. September 15th, when that stuff is due, you can start doing team assessments. We'll talk about flag football team assessments. Um, if you've done tennis in the past, which most of you have done, it's relatively similar. Um, so it shouldn't be too much of a change for you guys. October 2nd, that is when we need uh, postseason competition rosters turned in, your official competition rosters for team football and skills football. Um, especially if you want help setting up any sort of brackets for tournaments, um, set up divisions for skills play, so on and so forth, we will need those forms. October 2nd is also the day when we want all your coaches' forms in as well, so please make a note of that. And then October 8th through November 5th, uh, that's kind of the window for district tournaments. Again, we want you guys to have district tournaments just like tennis. And then we're still working on a date and location for our state tournament. It will not be a official state tournament like we typically do since we're doing a demo season, um, but we will have a culminating event that we will call a state tournament at the end of the day. Coaches training options. You'll see that it says option three. Typically, there's three options in here. This year for flag football startup, we're only doing one option. We want you guys to set a date for your coaches to get together in person with you you can go over the administrative stuff. Hey, here's the season timeline. Here's when I need your paperwork. Here's when we need stuff done by on your end, paperwork, admin stuff. And then I will bring out a flag football clinician. It'll either be myself, 
um, one of the community flag football coaches, Melissa Anger, who runs our community flag football program, or someone else that will teach the game to your coaches. We'll teach the game and teach how to coach the game, um, all the, the nuts and bolts of the game itself. But we want you guys to set up in-person coaches training dates. Um, we want that stuff and request to have a coaches training, to have a clinician on site. We want you guys to have that in no later than September 1st. Um, so it might be time before you bang up shop for school closing this year to really look at that August schedule to get a date on the books. Um, from there, we'll connect with you. We'll help. We'll train you guys. We'll get you guys up and running. But we need you guys to set the date and get your coaches together. Um, I'm going to keep track. Um, just let me know. These are the districts that are planning to do flag football. Let me know when your preseason meeting is. Again, we'll get a clinician out to your preseason meeting to teach the game on the field. Um, and then let us know when you plan to hold a district tournament. We plan to come and support your district tournaments, just like tennis. Um, and we're more than happy to help set them up and facilitate them alongside of you. So the checklist. We're not going to go through the, the super deep checklist here. Again, make sure you're reaching out to your schools or your coaches that have been around for a while. See if they're going to transition from tennis to flag football. If not, reach out to supervisors of athletics for your district and or athletic directors and say, hey, we're moving to flag football. We need coaches for X, Y, and Z schools. Who, who is going to be the point person? Who's going to be my coach? Who do I need to communicate with? Um, make sure the uh, vacancies are advertised. And then let us know. It will really, really helpful if you send us your coach's contact information for your new coaches. Um, with flag football being new, not all of your coaches will be quote unquote new, but we'll have new people technically leading every team. Um, good example, I know Roy's on here. Uh, Jen Miller from Allegheny County has expressed her interest. Um, so if she takes up the mantle, she's not necessarily a new coach. She coaches other unified sports, but we want her contact info anyway. So please get us your coach's contact info. Um, and then again, get your schedule for your coach's briefing um, on the schedule as soon as possible to let us know. Um, we will be doing recruitment posters. I'll have them sent directly to you as district reps and you can distribute them to the schools. Um, but we'll have all that stuff ready to go for you. Uh, we will send it likely in the summer. So I will contact you, um, maybe even text or phone call just to say, hey, these flyers are coming. Heads up, they'll be delivered to your school at X, Y, or Z day. Uh, recruitment. Um, think about with flag football, this is going to be a demo year. We're going to learn some things. Uh, we're going to grow in various ways. Think about how recruitment works for flag football. Um, most districts will probably approach it the same as they have with tennis, um, with the hopes that just the, the name of football compared to tennis will um, recruit a little bit better. If there's something unique we need to do to recruit for football, let me know. I'm open to different types of recruitment uh, processes and different recruitment tools that I can get for you or develop for you to make recruitment better. This stuff is the paperwork stuff. Um, we are going to get through this relatively quickly. Uh, this stuff is the same. It hasn't changed um, and we don't see it changing anytime soon. Um, as a reminder, student athletes that are participating on teams, athletes, unified partners, unified partners, IEP 504s, all need to fill out the application of participation to start the year. Even if they did it this past year, again, every new school year, they need to fill that form out. If you have a returning athlete or unified partner that's already played in previous years, they do not need to do the COVID form again, but if they're new, they will have to do the COVID form. I'm gonna do my best over the summer to work to get you a list of coaches and athletes and what certifications they do or do not have. Um, to help you upstart the season a little bit easier because I know that can be difficult. Um, the other thing is, again, we need to have them listed on the roster uh, at that due date of September 15th. We really, really, really need to have them on there. That also helps your LSS manager get everyone in. Um, again, if there's one or two Zs of people that come out later in the season that want to join that turn in the paperwork, we can handle that. But if we're missing five to 10 kids off of our roster, now your LSS manager is having to double back. It's really tough to catch up on that. This is the application for participation. Hasn't changed, won't change. Again, I will send you a um, fillable PDF version of that as well, which should be helpful for this year. CDW, which is our COVID form, 
hasn't changed, won't change. Uh, again, if student athletes have done it already, they don't need to. If they're new and this is their first time doing unified sports, they will have to do it. Uh, the team roster, nothing's changed here either. Again, the biggest thing that we always want to point out with this is on this slide in this top section, make sure you get everyone that's an adult or a team manager working with your team listed in that top section. Head coaches, assistant coaches, paraprofessionals, team managers, an athletic director that's just super involved and likes to be involved with unified sports. Anyone that could be going to whatever our state tournament, state event is that would need access to the field of play to work with that team needs to be on there to get into GMS. The other thing I'm reminding people of now is if you have a paraprofessional or a student manager or something that doesn't need to be on the field of play, that just works with your team in the stands, they do not need to do the paperwork and they do not need to be listed. They won't get a credential, but they do not need to do the paperwork and don't need to be listed. If you would like them to get a lunch, though, as part of the event, please do list them. What all this is saying is if you have anybody working with the team that is not a participant, again, if they're a coach, a team manager, a paraprofessional, an AD, whatever it may be, if they're working with the team, probably just put them on the top of the roster and it'll make your life a lot easier. Um, again, these gray sections are for LSS managers. Not many use them, but I know some do. Uh, so we leave them on the forms. So this is the non-student athlete section when we're talking head coaches, assistant coaches, team managers, so on and so forth. The main things that they need to do is they need to do our SOMD volunteer application slash background check. They need to complete the protective behaviors training, which is trimmed down to about 15 to 20 minutes, uh, which is really great. And then they have to submit a CDW COVID form if they have not done so already. The main thing to make this easy is go to Volunteer Hub. Again, we've shared the link with you. We can share the link again. Go to Volunteer Hub to do these trainings and to register. Once you register and create a login, it'll take you step by step through all these things to be done. And like I said, I'm going to do my best before the season starts to get you a report of who has what and who's missing what. So you guys can hop on that early in the season. This just takes you step by step through the protective behaviors training video. Um, again, it's pretty easy. There's a quiz at the end. You get a certificate. Awesome. Um, once you're done with that volunteer application, again, talks how you go through Volunteer Hub, how you enter into the fields of how you go and register. It'll tell you what to do. It takes you step by step. It's nice and easy. Um, and for some reason, if you have a student athlete or a student manager, when they click I'm under 18, it won't do a background check on them. It'll ask for references so we can call references. Um, can't do background checks on anyone younger than 18. Um, again, the three things that you need to do if you are a non-student athlete, you need to do the protective behaviors training, volunteer hub uh, applications slash background check, and the COVID CDW form. If for some reason you have somebody that's not great with uh, internet, doesn't have great internet connection, and wants to do the physical paperwork, reach out to me and let me know. I can get you that as well. Typically, that's also on our website. Um, this is just some best practice stuff uh, with uh, LSS managers. Again, they can go through. If they have questions, we also have um, additional resources for them to go through and go step by step with a documented resource if they need help for registration. Um, that's not something you guys need to go through, um, but that's the, the main deal. Any questions on paperwork or anything, that's pretty much the same thing as usual for us, regardless of flag football being new. All right, not seeing questions with people opening or in the chat. Um, we'll keep rolling. Uh, flag football and unified skills. We're going to talk about the sport itself a little bit now, um, talk about the format of the sport, talk about how we facilitate it through unified sports. Um, our community program has actually been facilitating flag football for quite a few years now, um, and they have some really strong unified teams. So we've really had a good opportunity to nail down flag football to give you guys a strong experience out of the gate for IUS. We're going to offer two different event formats. Unified team, which is just going to be typical fly football, 5v5, you know, minimum of eight on a roster, maximum of 12, get on the field, throw, run the football, first downs, touchdowns, so on and so forth. Uh, unified skills team, 
will be the skill stations, but we will do it in a unified format with pairs of athletes and partners. And you can have up to four pairs on a unified skills team. They get a collective score, so on and so forth. So let's talk unified team play uh, and rosters, right? Um, one of the biggest things is the rosters, the roster minimum for team play, your traditional lineup, run the ball, throw the ball, touchdowns, you know, interceptions, whatever, typical football play. Um, minimum roster is eight while the maximum is 12. You'll see a little note there uh, that in the unified and traditional teams for the rule book for Special Olympics International, the maximum roster size is 10. We bumped it to 12 to give you a little bit more flexibility um, and allow for more substitutions because it is a little bit more of a fast paced and semi-physical sport compared to um, some of the other sports that we offer. On the field of play, there's five players during play. There's two unified, uh, for unified teams, there's two partners and three athletes, um, and that's the consistent. You'll never have more than two unified partners. You'll never have uh, less than three athletes. That's always the formula of five on the field, every down that's played. Gameplay, it's a 60-yard field uh, with typical football possessions, um, six-point touchdowns, so on and so forth. Um, we play very much the same game as intramurals uh, through NURSA for colleges play. So if you have any experience with college intramural flag football, um, it's pretty much the same thing. We're not going to go through all the rules and stuff tonight. I will share the unified sports um, rule book with you guys that you can read through. Um, but we will do more of a deep rules coverage when it comes to your coaches trainings in August. Uh, unified team skills. The minimum roster is two, which would be an athlete and partner, and the maximum roster is eight, which is four pairs of athletes and partners. Uh, the team must be comprised of pairs of athletes and partners. Um, can't be athletes and athletes, can't be partners and partners. Um, so again, you can have a minimum of two. You can have a whole skills team that's two people, one athlete, one partner. If that's what works for your district, that that's works for a team in your district. That's totally fine. So the example we're giving is Coach Zach's team has six participants, three athletes, three unified partners who Coach Zach pairs up at the beginning of the year to work together to learn the skill station. The main thing that we do want happening with unified uh, skills play is that when you pair up an athlete and a partner, you know, the first week or two, you may pair them up to see who works with who. But once they get comfortable, keep them in the same pairs. We want them to get used to each other. When it comes to the gameplay, essentially, again, if you've ever experienced punt packs and kick for um, football through the NFL or whatever it may be, this is very similar to the format. There's skill stations. Also, like we have skill stations for tennis. The gameplay is there's a 40-yard dash that can be done either in a wheelchair, not in a wheelchair, on grass. Um, we can do it on the track. Both options are on the table. Uh, all the facilities that we're targeting for our tournament location will have um, turf field and will have uh, track access. Target pass, we set up targets, uh, different points that are allotted for hitting each different difficulty of depth for the target that you throw at, uh, throwing for distance, flag pulling, uh, which is a little bit of movement too, again, can be done in a wheelchair. We've seen it and had it done in community program. Um, and then right now we have a station that's footwork but we anticipate that we're going to be changing that to pass catching because that is the one aspect of football that we don't have in skills at the moment. Um, again, this is a great opportunity for athletes that might be lower skill level, that might be needing a year or two to develop to get into the game format of flag football. Um, also could be a great opportunity for smaller schools to get started until they have enough to play full team flag football as well. Team assessment forms. Uh, this is where we'll talk about it. Um, we'll actually go a little bit deeper when it comes to your coaches' trainings. We'll do some right on site and we'll kind of walk through a mock assessment as well. Um, again, it's, it's self rating the team's ability. Uh, we use this for divisioning and matchmaking um, at the beginning of the season. Once you guys play a little bit, we get a better sense of what it is, but it really gives us a baseline to start pairing teams up for play. Um, again, use it to your advantage to be as accurate as possible. If you are a little low on your athletes, if you're a little high on your athletes, it's going to make it tough until we see a couple games, uh, but usually evens out at the end with flag football. 
This is also going to establish your rosters once you're done and submitted. Um, if you have 20 kids come out, you know, you assess all of them. It'll give you a good idea of which individuals should be on which team based on their skill level. Um, again, we will help you do assessments this first year. We're not just going to throw you into the deep end, um, but it's something good to get used to and get good at learning, just like the tennis assessment word ones. Um, you must have your assessment submitted prior to your district tournament. Again, it's one of those things that helps us know who your team is, what their assessment scores are. And if we, you know, pair you up at a state or district tournament, it'll give us a better idea of who is who and who's appropriate to play each other. Um, we'll enter your assessments on our end into our, our system. Um, mostly we use a spreadsheet for that and we use a little bit of GMS as well. Um, again, please make sure as district reps that you guys are checking uh, assessments for accuracy. Um, I think a really good example from this past year was we had someone do a bocce assessment for outdoor and their total score was like 212. The average high score for outdoor bocce is typically like 1500. Um, so 212 is like a, a world champion setting bocce team. So uh, we didn't catch that until the end. So it made it really hard to make sure that they got into an appropriate division. And because we didn't have a good idea based on their assessments or where to put them, they didn't end up in a great division for the state tournament. So again, um, make sure those are things that you're looking at. And again, read through the common errors here um, as you're doing your assessment reviews to make sure um, that it makes sense. Just a reminder, uh, if you haven't been part of our uh, team registration, um, we want when you have multiple teams, if Allegheny High School has multiple teams, we want Allegheny High School Team 1, Allegheny High School Team 2. Um, we appreciate when you do fun things with team colors or mascots or whatever it may be. It makes it really hard for us to keep track of which is which. Um, so again, please remember to do school name and then which team number it is. This is the assessment. Uh, there's two pages of the assessment. This is the first page. The first page looks a lot like our roster that we have you guys turn in. Um, but additionally, you see that they have different sections here. Um, for community program, we ask for age, height, weight, uh, because there's a potential impact on uh, the minimal physicality of flag football that could happen there. But for the most part, high schoolers are all high schoolers. Um, bodies may be different, but again, uh, if that's something that coaches don't necessarily want to fill in, we don't need that. Um, but it does help for our um, uh, community flag football. So, again, as you go through this first season, if that seems like something that would help, um, great. If not, we can also scrap that as well. This is the assessment uh, itself. When we come out to do your coaches' trainings, we will go through and we will go through each one of these. We will do a demonstration of what it looks like, and then what each level um, of passing looks like, of receiving looks like, of routes looks like. Um, we'll go through all that stuff so you have an idea of what the baseline for rating is. Um, but again, if you've done tennis in the past, it's kind of similar to how tennis works. You go out for tennis, you have some doubles play, and you rate them on how well they move, how well they do forehand, backhand, how well they serve it. It's a very similar concept. We'll just get you guys in the groove this first year of, you know, hey, this is what we, our perception of blocking looks like, game awareness, so on and so forth. Rules of gameplay. Um, just so you know, these are very basic high-level rules. Um, again, I will share tomorrow with the slides and the recording of the webinar. I will share with you the um, rules for flag football through Special Olympics International. There's a unified section in there, has all this stuff. Uh, games are two 20-minute halves, and it's running clock until the last minute of each half. Um, there's a one-minute warning, clock stops on dead ball plays uh, when you're in the last minute of each half. So your typical um, incomplete pass, you know, uh, fumbles are incomplete passes for us. Um, anything that's a dead ball play running out of bounds, any of those things will stop the clock. Um, so typical clock stoppage under two minutes in a college football or NFL game, is what we do under one minute. Um, 
Overtime, there's some detailed rules, but the basic concept for overtime is the team that started with the first overtime possession will possess the ball in the second and next overtime. It's college football overtime if you're used to that. Essentially, come together, flip the coin, choose who goes first. If they score, the other team gets a chance to score. If they score, we go in the second overtime, flip-flop, so on and so forth. Um, Again, if you're used to college football overtime, it's pretty much the same deal. Scoring. Uh, Again, every touchdown is six points. Standard football gameplay. Extra points for us. You can get one point. There's no field goals. (laughs) That's what I should start with. Extra points, there's no field goals. And so to get extra points, you line up for an additional play after a touchdown. If you want to go for one point, it's from the six-yard line. If you want to go for two points, it's from the 12-yard line. Um, Again, you can run it, you can pass it, whatever it may be, but there are no field goals for your extra points. Um, Running the ball, uh, quarterback can't run the ball. It's one of those things where the quarterback either hands it off or throws it. There's no running. Um, We're not looking for Lamar Jackson, uh, the the second coming of Lamar Jackson here in Maryland. Um, But the quarterback can move behind the line of scrimmage. They just can't advance the ball. Um, and then ball carriers must make an effort to avoid defenders if they establish position. It's kind of that same concept as a charge in uh, basketball. If uh, you have a defender who plants their feet and stops and they're going to attempt to pull the flag, you can't run them over. Uh, again, it's flag football. It's not tackle football. Um, ball carriers must make an effort to avoid that defender at that point. And then additionally, we have things that nurse of flag football does not have. It's called the no run zone. Um, any ball snapped from or on the uh, zone has to be passed. The no run zones can be found five yards before each of the end zones and then five yards before the midfield first down line. I'll share a diagram that shows you what that looks like. It'll make a lot of sense there. Um, It's something that I really love about the way we do unified flag football with Special Olympics. When I worked for uh, Drexel University intramurals, Flag football didn't have that. And if you're on the one inch line, you can kind of just jam it across. And with flag football, that doesn't make sense. Um, So it's a really great rule and a really good way to diversify the game for our flag football athletes. Um, Passing and receiving. If a player steps out of bounds, they may not be the first one to touch the ball. Um, That has recently been brought up again. It's called illegal touching uh, as an official if that happens. Um, So again, if you're a receiver, you can't step out of bounds, step back and bounce and catch a football. Um, Again, you can see a trend if you know typical football rules. For the most part, we're running typical football rules, especially if you know flag football. Um, It's pretty standardized across the board at this point. Um, Oh, one more thing about passing. Uh, There there has been a question and concern with how passing works with uh, unified partners, right? We don't want unified partners dominating the game. We want them participating. We want them developing uh, chemistry and relationships with the athletes as well. Unified partners cannot pass to unified partners. If you have a quarterback that is your unified partner, they need to give the ball to a um, an athlete with an intellectual disability or a unified partner IEP 504. Um, unified partners can't just be throwing fades and fly routes down the field uh, to other unified partners. The best teams that we have in our community program that are unified, that have really strong teams, they have athletes that are quarterbacks because athletes can distribute the ball anywhere. They can give it to another athlete. They can give it to a unified partner. It just diversifies the ability for the game to happen. With that said, if you have a team that needs to have a, a unified partner as a quarterback just to kind of be that point guard of stuff, you can still play the game. You just got to be a little bit more unique with how you do it. Screen blocking. Um, screen blocking is allowed. Uh, after assuming a legal screen blocking position, you know, can't use your hands. Essentially, it's it's a pick and basketball. Hands either have to be in the front or behind you. Um, a player can essentially shuffle left to right. Um, and unless they move into a opposing player to create contact, they can shuffle and move to quote unquote block. Um, So again, these are things that will be a lot easier to understand once we get on the field with you guys in August. But again, that's why we want your in-person coaches meetings so we can come and do that stuff. Um, Again, penalties you can read through here. Um, Pre-snap penalties are five yards replay the down. Offensive post-snap penalties are five yards loss of down. It's a lot of that same typical stuff. 
Um, we've made it a little bit easier where like we don't have a specific pass interference rule. If pass interference is called as a post snap defensive penalty, um, it's five yards and an automatic first down. Um, again, it's not, you know, NFL, wherever the spot of the foul is. So again, um, read through these and get a little bit of an idea, but we'll, we'll coach you through um, and coach your coaches through the rules a little bit more in detail in August. Um, again, running the ball, the ball carrier can now spin when they're running the ball to avoid defenders. Um, one of the biggest things with flag football that is an issue is flag guarding. Um, again, we don't want people blocking people from being able to pull the flags. It's gone back and forth years after years about spinning being a flag guarding technique. Uh, but we'll show you that there's an appropriate spin and an inappropriate spin when it comes to flag guarding when we do your coaches training. For the most part, if somebody's going to spin, you got to have your arms up and the flag's got to still be accessible. Um, it's one of those things where it's legal, but we see a lot of people with their hands down and it becomes flag guarding. But again, we'll show you and we'll help you with that stuff as well. Um, and again, there's no limit of steps for a screen blocker, uh, but the blocker must beat the defender to the spot. If they don't, the defender has the right away. Um, I do flag football officiating for our community program. So again, I can help you with all these rules. Um, and if you have questions, let me know, but we'll also send you the rule book to read through as well. Questions on rules and stuff before we hit uniforms. I'm gonna take a minute to take a sip of my iced tea. So I'm doing a lot of talking. All right, I'm not seeing anything in the chat. We're going to keep rolling along. Uh, we're going to keep this nice and streamlined without questions here. Um, uniforms. Uniforms for flag football are the typical deal for IUS everything. Um, they need to have your team name slash school name, and they need to have that Special Olympics Unified Sports pill. Um, that's the main deal. It's always been the main deal, and it's the same for flag football. Talking specifically about uniform tops. Uh, again, we're getting a little bit more specific with uniforms because we've had some issues this past year with people showing up wearing jeans and stuff like that. Again, that's not appropriate uh, attire for participating in a sport. Like football, tennis, we tend to see a little bit less with it because it's a, a little bit more of a high movement sport compared to bocce and other sports. Um, but for tops, flag football uniforms, you got to have matching tops. The biggest thing is they do need to have large numbers on the front and the back. If your uniform does not have large numbers on the front and the back, they are not legal for flag football. Um, again, they can be t-shirts, they can be jerseys, they can be other traditional athletic tops like Under Armour stuff. They need to have big numbers on the front and the back. Again, with the team name or school name, with the unified logo. If you guys have tennis uniforms that you want to repurpose, you can go ahead and use your tennis uniforms, but you need to figure out a way to get numbers on it. Is it if it's resending it to rescreen print them? If even for this season, you need to write big numbers on them in, you know, with big block markers, that's okay with us. Reach out to me if you need help. Let us know. Um, we know that, you know, transitioning from tennis to flag football might be a little bit different, but the biggest uniform thing for flag football, is you have to have numbers on the front and the back. When it comes to your uniform bottoms, as long as they're single color bottoms that you typically wear, just like any other unified sport, they can be shorts, athletic pants, sweatpants. Whatever you want, as long as they're matching in colors and don't have large logos and they're not leggings and they're not jeans, they're perfectly fine. Um, again, typical unified sports bottoms are fine with us as well. The additional things for flag football. For flag football, all participants must wear a mouthpiece during play. The second they step onto that field, they need a mouthpiece. 99.9% .9 of our officials before they even start a game will do the, the little league soccer thing where they line everybody up and they'll do smile and they'll make them smile and show them the mouth guard. Um, but again, this is not negotiable while fly football for unified sports is much less contact than traditional football. It occasionally happens. Uh, there's, there are occasionally bumps and bruises and that kind of stuff, but you have to wear a mouthpiece. Um, this doesn't include skills. There's no contact at all in skills. So it's not needed for skills. If you have skills participants that want to wear them like the rest of the team, absolutely fine. If you have skills participants that you envision that may trend upwards and eventually be on the actual flag football team as a whole, 
probably good to get them in the groove of wearing it when they participate in skills anyway. Um, the other thing for football is <laughs> football tends to have some extra gear uh, that is totally optional. Uh, for the most part, we're good with that stuff. When it comes to flag football, again, as long as it's similar colors to your team uniform, headbands, uh, facial cold gear, like the, the stuff that comes up over your mouth uh, or over the top of your head, football gloves, single arm sleeves, like the, the shooter sleeves, uh, wristbands, so on and so forth, are fine as long as they're a similar color to your team uniform. If for some reason an official asks one of your student athletes to remove an article because it's unnecessary or causes um, an issue for others' participations, please just comply and you know take it off. If there's a question about it, um, take it off and then come check with me. Uh, again, we can work through it. But for the most part, um, most things go for flag football. Um, the only thing that I would say that we haven't allowed are like hard shelled elbow pads and stuff like that that you would typically see for rollerblading and ice skating and stuff um, we typically don't allow those any questions on uniform stuff okay i don't see anything in the chat um this is a look ahead stuff uh again meredith is on here she'll be reaching out and communicating with you guys um this past season for track and field she did a really good job reaching out weekly and kind of just saying, hey, this is the stuff that's coming up. Here are the deadlines that's coming up. Who needs help with what? If you guys, especially in this first year of flag football, can do us a solid and reach out weekly when Meredith reaches out and say, hey, uh, I'm struggling with X, Y, or Z, or I'm good. Um, I'll let you know next week if something comes up. Just let us know you're alive and you got a pulse and you're okay. Um, again, we're, we're navigating flag football for the first year together, so – let us know what you need help with. Don't be afraid to reach out and say, look, like I, I ordered flags and I thought they were going to be in on time and they're not going to be in on time. Can you guys help me with that? Reach out for that stuff. Again, hey, where do you get you, your officials for? I want officials for my district tournament. Reach out for that stuff. Just make sure you're communicating and reaching out early. And between Meredith and I, we'll make it happen to help you guys out and support you guys. That's it. That's the whole presentation for now. Again, we wanted to get your, your feet wet. We wanted to get you rolling with some information for flag football. Like I said, I think the biggest key to this season will be your coaches meetings preseason. Um, please get those dates on the books as soon as possible so we can put it on our calendar to get a clinician out there to do an on-field training. Um, I think we're going to have the best success by setting that tone to start the year. Um, and then again, as we have questions, as we go along, as we have answers for you, like state tournament dates and stuff like that, just reach out. We'll reach out to you. We'll keep communicating um, and pass that stuff along. Um, before we wrap it up a little bit early, any questions, comments, concerns going into summer before flag football starts? Okay. Um, Meredith, anything you want to add before we get out of here? Nope, I'm just excited for the season. For sure, for sure. So again, thank you guys for everything you did this year. Um, next year, uh, we'll be here before we even know it. Do enjoy your summer, get some time off, get a little bit of a break. Um, again, you have my cell phone number, you have my email. Reach out if you need anything. Um, reach out even if you just want to tell me how nice your vacation was this summer. Um, I'd love to hear that you get some time off and get a little bit to relax. Uh, but again, if you need anything, let us know. We're extremely excited for this first year of flag football. Um, there's going to be things that go really well. There's going to be things that go not so well that we're going to fix for future years. Uh, but we're excited to do this with you. And we're excited to have this experience with your athletes and uh, unified partners. So thank you guys. Enjoy the rest of your night. And we will send a follow-up email tomorrow. Thank you. Take care.